Girdle Escher Bach by Douglas Hofstetter. Notes and Review. Girdle Escher Bach, an eternal golden braid by Douglas Hofstetter, is his Pulitzer Prize winning contribution to the field of artificial intelligence, logic, consciousness, and metamathematics. I worked my way backward through some of his catalog over the last few years and had hoped to issue this review of the book much sooner. As fate would have it, the last few chapters of my notes were lost to the digital void, which required me to go back and reread a few chapters to reproduce my thoughts. No small task indeed. The book can be said to be sensible and nonsensical. I mean that which is perceivable versus those things which appear illogical. That which is perceivable being those things quantifiable and qualifiable. While the illogical classes exist within elusive and intangible spaces. Many have written on a computer's need of an oracle. Humans which input the spark to action. However, there's little mention of timescale regarding the exchange. Can't oracle become an honorary title from one self-perpetuating species to another once there's not a reliance on it? Introduction, a musicological offering. This section introduces the trio of Gödel, Escher, and Bach. It addresses what concepts of theirs are focused on by Hofstetter and the underlying thematic continuity overlap he perceived in their works. I have sought to weave an eternal golden braid out of these three strands, Girdle, Escher, Bach. I began intending to write an essay at the core of which would be Girdle's theorem. I imagined it would be a mere pamphlet. But my ideas expanded like a sphere and soon touched Bach and Escher. It took some time for me to think of making this connection explicit, instead of just letting it be a private, motivating force. But finally I realized that to me, Gödel and Escher and Bach were only shadows cast in different directions by some central, solid essence. I tried to reconstruct the central object and came up with this book. Over the course of this book, Hofstetter uses a variety of intelligence tests to outline the progress of AI leaning on the concept of self-reference heavily to illustrate how intelligence's scaffold abilities. No one knows where the borderline between non-intelligent behavior and intelligent behavior lies. In fact, to suggest that a sharp borderline exists is probably silly. But essential abilities for intelligence are certainly to respond to situations very flexibly, to take advantage of fortuitous circumstances, to make sense out of ambiguous, or contradictory messages, to recognize the relative importance of different elements of a situation, to find similarities between situations despite differences which may separate them, to draw distinctions between situations despite similarities which may link them, to synthesize new concepts by taking old concepts and putting them together in new ways, to come up with ideas that are novel. Chapter 1 The Moo Puzzle. Formally axiomatic systems and exiting the system. The halting problem. I finished Metamath by Gregory Chaitin some time back before GEB. It's a really great book that examines math and philosophy through history with a focus on randomness and the halting problem. I'm not going to go too deep into that book, but you can take a look for my notes online uh, in regard to that. I do think that it would be useful to read that book in advance of GEB, just so you can kind of wrap your head around some metamathematical concepts that he addresses in that book, which is, you know, very related to Gerdelian incompleteness as well. And just the nature of computation, not ever really being able to resolve under some conditions. Chapter 2, Meaning and Form in Mathematics. Dichotomies. Meaningful versus meaningless. Symbolic logic and representation. This is a good point to get familiar with Gödel's proof. In the middle of reading GEB, I took a break and went back and read his annotated version of Gödel's proof, which was originally published by Nagel and Newman. Uh, He had a personal relationship with one of these writers and um, kind of fell in love with this book very early on. 
and later in his career uh, was offered the opportunity to annotate uh, their their release and he does a very good job of simplifying incompleteness inside of this book I, I would definitely recommend reading this book as well before getting into GEB it's funny that here I am reviewing one book and suggesting you read two others in advance the concept of isomorphism is introduced within this chapter as well some of my notes in this early introductory uh, stage of the idea is about pattern seeking and inversions so within his text he leans on the analogy of positive and negative space chapter three figure and ground recursive intention meaning emerges from focus there exist formal systems whose negative space set of non-theorems is not the positive space set of theorems of any formal system there exist recursively innumerable sets which are not recursive there exist formal systems for which there is no typographical decision procedure intuitive fluidity bridging these dichotomous binaries can require intuitive fluidity chapter four consistency completeness geometry isomorphic lenses for analogical comparisons above i use the word isomorphism in quotes to indicate that it must be taken with a grain of salt the symbolic processes which underlie the understanding of human language are so much more complex than the symbolic processes in typical formal systems that if we want to continue thinking of meaning as mediated by isomorphisms we shall have to adopt a far more flexible conception of what isomorphisms can be than we have up till now in my opinion in fact the key element in answering the question what is consciousness will be the unraveling of the nature of the isomorphism which underlies meaning self-reference and box fugues one day without warning bach regained his vision but a few hours later he suffered a stroke and 10 days later he died leaving it for others to speculate on the incompleteness of the art of the fugue could it have been caused by Bach's attainment of self-reference consistency inconsistency when every theorem upon interpretation comes out true in some imaginable world completeness when all statements which are true in some imaginable world and which can be expressed as well-formed strings of the system are theorems chapter five recursive structures and processes embedded media i really like the idea of recursion i really like the idea of rhythmic diminution um, so here i'm sharing a photo of the peristyle leading to the music hall this is a visual representation of rhythmic diminution I think of these things as echoes but echoes with variable time hofstetter introduces rtn's recursive transition networks here these diagrams will show you what he's meaning so you can see that an entire system can be embedded within itself if you're looking at these these diagrams when i first saw these it actually kind of reminded me of Feynman diagrams which is used to to map particles in physics thus the point is that a physical particle a renormalized particle involves one a bare particle and two a huge tangle of virtual particles inextricably wound together in a recursive mess every real particle's existence therefore involves the existence of infinitely many other particles contained in a virtual cloud which surrounds it as it propagates and each of the virtual particles in the cloud of course also drags along its own virtual cloud 
and so on ad infinitum. So here we have actually a diagram of uh, some Feynman graphs. We're looking at magnetic moment probabilities and polarization uh, of photons um, charting their spin. Hofstetter's law. It always takes longer than you expect, even when you take into account Hofstetter's law. Chapter 6, The Location of Meaning. Message and interpretation rely on when and where. Imaginary spacescape. In asking about the meaning of a molecule of DNA above, I use the phrase compelling inner logic, and I think this is a key notion. To illustrate this, let us slightly modify our hypothetical record into space event by substituting John Cage's imaginary landscape number four for the Bach. This piece is a classic of aleatoric or chance music. Music whose structure is chosen by various random processes rather than by an attempt to convey a personal emotion. In this case, 24 performers attach themselves to the 24 knobs on 12 radios. For the duration of the piece, they twiddle their knobs in aleatoric ways so that each radio randomly gets louder and softer, switching stations all the while. The total sound produced is the piece of music. Cage's attitude is expressed in his own words. To let sounds be themselves rather than vehicles for man-made theories or expressions of human sentiments. Layered meanings, right? Three layers of any message. In these examples of decipherment of -of out-of-context messages, we can separate out fairly clearly three levels of information. One, the frame message. Two, the outer message. And three, the inner message. The one we are most familiar with is three, the inner message. It is the message which is supposed to be transmitted, the emotional experiences in music, the phenotype in genetics, the royalty and rights of ancient civilizations and tablets, etc. To understand the inner message is to have extracted the meaning intended by the sender. The frame message is the message. I am a message. Decode me if you can. And it is implicitly conveyed by the gross structural aspects of any information bearer. To understand the frame message is to recognize the need for a decoding mechanism. If the frame message is recognized as such, then attention is switched to level two, the outer message. This is information implicitly carried by symbol patterns and structures in the message, which tells how to decode the inner message. To understand the outer message is to build or to know how to build the correct decoding mechanism for the inner message. Sameness and differentness. This makes me think of an underlying universal language, some informational substrate underlying our interpretations. Meaning is intrinsic if intelligence is natural. Now, if people's different jukeboxes have different songs in them and responded to given triggers in completely idiosyncratic ways, then we would have no inclination to attribute intrinsic meaning to those triggers. However, human brains are so constructed that one brain responds in much the same way to a given trigger as does another brain, all other things being equal. This is why a baby can learn any language. It responds to triggers in the same way as any other baby. This uniformity of human jukeboxes establishes a uniform language in which frame messages and outer messages can be communicated. If, furthermore, we believe that human intelligence is just one example of a general phenomenon in nature, the emergence of intelligent beings in widely varying contexts, then presumably the language in which frame messages and outer messages are communicated among humans is a dialect of a universal language by which intelligences can communicate with each other. Thus, there would be certain kinds of triggers which would have universal triggering power in that all intelligent beings would tend to respond to them in the same way as we do. Chapter 7, The Propositional Calculus Conflicting axioms, theorems, logic puzzles, and symbolic representation. Here are the rules of propositional calculus. Now, I'm not going to read through these each each individually because, you know, there's a lot of uh, symbolic representation and that just seems exhausting to go through. But if you are familiar with symbolic logic, you know, this will not be completely foreign to you. If you've taken any sort of logic class in philosophy, 
you know, you've probably run across this stuff as well. This is the isomorphic connection between uh, philosophy and computation, I would say. Prudence and imprudence. Chapter 8, Typographical Number Theory. Abstracting abstraction. Symbolic representation for modifications. Isomorphic relationships. Collisions of meaning disconnected from intentional directionality. Structuring passages of logic. Implications of tension as related to outcomes. Minimal, viable reasoning. Chapter 9. Mumon and Girdle. Duality. The juxtaposition of incompleteness and totality. Balanced interpretation requires the unknown. Ism is an anti-philosophy, a way of being without thinking. Apparently, the master wants to get across the idea that an enlightened state is one where the borderlines between the self and the rest of the universe are dissolved. This would truly be the end of dualism, for as he says, there is no system left which has any desire for perception. But what is that state if not death? How can a live human being dissolve the borderlines between himself and the outer world? Here I begin to think about the musical concept of hemiola, which is to say that you can create temporal inversions by adjusting where your emphasis is uh, within a pattern of notes, a sequence of notes. So uh, I actually did a piece of music that, that does this pretty extensively. There's many different ways for you to interpret where the downbeat is or the one because there are a handful of instruments that are actually playing different time signatures against each other simultaneously, which is fun. Love it. Here, Hofstetter introduces ATNs, an augmented transition network. Algorithmic, symbol interpretation, and substitutes. So here we are seeing some of the logical symbols represented numerically, right? So he's going to utilize this to create strings. The reason why he's doing this will become apparent as we continue on. A good way of thinking about duality and isomorphisms and some of the other ideas laid out here would be statements that create paradoxical loops, such as, this statement is false. Chapter 10, Levels of Description and Computer Systems. Here we begin to dive a little deeper into string management, I guess you might think about it, uh, or string interpretation. So he introduces the idea of chunking, right? Uh, above, you see some chunks, right? But then they can also be coupled and create larger chunks. So we have what is machine language, right? Binary zeros and ones and assembly language, the computer languages that, that humans code in using words. Um, not always, obviously, you know, we use symbols too within code, but we aren't speaking in on and off notions at, at a metal level. And that's how we translate between humans and technology, modern, modern computer technology, that is. Here you can see a representation of how humans and computers interface, along with the use of a compiler, which is how you couple these languages into a functioning computer program. There are many levels of interpretation. Here you can see, let's start at the very bottom, transistors, right? Metal. Flip-flops and gates, which is basically, you know, indicating, is this thing receiving, sending, uh, where is it going? Is it on? Is it off, right? Uh, registers and data paths, machine instructions, compiler or interpreter, Lisp, which is an actual language, uh, embedded pattern matcher, and intelligent programs at the top, you know, executables, things that will actually perform functions when you input data. Some thoughts on this are compartmentalization, which you can see in those layers, and leaking. The idea that um, you know one layer's concepts and processing might dip into a, a layer above or a layer below. Epiphenomena, a visible consequence of the overall system organization. Things that emerge out of the collection. 
that can only emerge once the collection is assembled, like the output or the program, you know, what we interface with, whether that is the, the product or the, the actual software. Chapter 11, Brains and Thoughts. Calculus of descriptions, intentionally floating and flexible. Neurons represent this idea, uh, you know, as good as anything else. And, and here we have a diagram of a neuron. If you haven't had any courses or your path is not crossed with this information, you can see this cell. So you've got dendrites, you got your body. The dendrites receive signals from other cells. If the signal is strong enough, then a neuron will hit action potential and send a signal down the axon into the extremities there which are connected to the dendrites of another cell, another neuron that will pass on the, the signal. Brains and regions, here we've got a diagram of the brain as it was understood in 1966. You can see all kinds of different segments outlined. You know, again, if you haven't seen this before, haven't seen it kind of broken up this way. Um, yeah, of course, you know, in the last 60 years, Plus, we have a greater understanding of this, and we have broken down these sections more and more uh, and, and mapped them out with imaging technology. We understand them a, a little better, but you know, there's still plenty of mystery there. The, the point here is that the nature of memory is non-localizable. Localizable connectivity of neurons right, exists, though, but a memory does not exist in any one particular neuron. These, these cells are specialized. Uh, some for visual motion perception. Here we have a diagram that kind of outlines how neurons respond to visual information. And again, these are symbolic representations. These are not um, definitive at, at that point in time. It's just telling you that certain neurons, certain groups of neurons even, are scheduled to interpret particular types of data. Next is a list of symbol brain interaction types. One, various different modes or depths of activation of a single class symbol. Number two, simultaneous activation of several class symbols in some coordinated manner. Number three, activation of a single instance symbol in conjunction with activation of several class symbols. Number five, simultaneous activation of several instance symbols and several class symbols in some coordinated manner, indicating how our brain spins up and lights up relative to stimuli. This means that you can consider the brain as an ATN colony. Here he outlines a couple of different types of knowledge, the first being declarative knowledge, explicitly stored, readable by the programmer, and program as fact, local. And you have procedural knowledge, distributed chunks, epiphenomenon, how-to, and the pairing here, to me, is retrieved versus assembled. Can we recollect or do we manufacture uh, this new realization? Chapter 12, Minds and Thoughts. What is lost in translation? What isn't? A large portion of every human's network of symbols is universal. Etherware. Here he outlines the concept of etherware, the pure concepts which lie back of the software. Again, that substrate, that data substrate underlying, right? Consciousness is that property of a system that arises whenever there exist symbols in the system which obey triggering patterns somewhat like the ones described. Here he introduces his concept of I, the self-referential I, right? I think, therefore, I am as a subsystem, a constellation of symbols. While drawing, I sometimes feel as if I were a spiritualist medium, controlled by the creatures which I am conjuring up. It is as if they themselves decide on the shape in which they choose to appear. They take little account of my critical opinion during their birth, and I cannot exert much influence on the measure of their development. They are usually very difficult and obstinate creatures. Chapter 13, Bloop and Floop and Gloop. Now here he is theorizing some different types of computer programming languages. First being Bloop, bounded loops. 
Core truths of N, primitive recursive truths, only predictably terminating calculations, order versus chaos. Algorithms, you can think of as operations and controls. Functions which are bloop computable are primitive recursive functions, fundamental building blocks, diagonal arguments, incomplete totalities. Floop, a free loop, boundless, creates the potential for non-termination, substitution of representation. Now, that non-termination, right, that's when we start to get to the idea of Gerdelian incompleteness. You start getting to the halting problem. So you see why I suggested reading some of these other books in advance of getting here, because if you haven't kind of made some sense out of these ideas, it will be difficult to rapidly advance through some of these ideas inside of GEB. Finally, we have Gloop. It's mythological. Floop is the most unbounded a computer language can be, but he's suggesting that there is something outside of the system, but he's suggesting that this thing emerges as a result of the system. Next, he goes into the church Turing thesis rules. Number one, what is human computable is machine computable. Number two, what is machine computable is floop computable. Number three, what is human computable is floop computable, i.e. general or partial recursive. Chapter 14, on formally undecidable propositions of TNT. Some of my notes here are self-scrutiny and attention to self, symbol manipulation, proof pairs. Here he outlines, proof pairness is primitive recursive. The reason I am stressing the boundedness of these loops is, as you may have sensed, that I am about to assert fundamental fact one, the property of being a proof pair is a primitive recursive number theoretical property and can therefore be tested for by a bloop program. This made me begin to think about factoring and compression as they relate to isomorphism. And is therefore represented in TNT. The key concept at this juncture then is fundamental fact one given above. For from it we can conclude fundamental fact two. The property of forming a proof pair is testable in Bloop, and consequently it is represented in TNT by some formula having two free variables. Some thoughts. On this segment are self-referential loops, you know, embedding and abbreviations. A quine. We're going to go deeper into this, which is basically, it's the concept that a thing can have its own code embedded within itself to replicate. Last thought here would be correlated yet incongruently divergent number theories. Chapter 15, jumping out of the system. Infinite axiomization coupled with incompleteness. The idea that you could go forever and still never have everything. Embedded self-reference and derivative loops. Three rules here. Number one, that the system should be rich enough so that all desired statements about numbers, whether true or false, can be expressed in it. Failure on this count means that the system is from the very start too weak to be counted as a rival to TNT because it can't even express number theoretical notions that TNT can. In the metaphor of the Contra Crosta Punctus, it is as if one did not have a phonograph, but a refrigerator or some other kind of object. Number two, that all general recursive relations should be represented by formulas in the system. Failure on this count means that the system fails to capture in a theorem some general recursive truth, which can only be considered a pathetic belly flop if it is attempting to produce all of number theory's truths. In the Contra Crosta Punctus metaphor, this is like having a record player, but one of low fidelity. Number three, that the axioms and typographical patterns defined by its rules be recognizable by some terminating decision procedure. Failure on this count means that there is no method to distinguish valid derivations in the system from invalid ones. Thus, that the formal system is not formal after all, and in fact, is not even well defined. In the Contra Crosta Punctus metaphor, it is a phonograph which is still on the drawing board, only partially designed. 
Existing outside of the system is an illusion. But the illusion exists. Gloop-like. Chapter 16, Self-Ref and Self-Rep. Self-Representation. Here you can see this tweet that I put together. It's, it's not real code, but it is uh, a code that replica replicates itself. Reference can be thought of as translation, transposition, augmentation, in my opinion. Editing and processing interactions with strands, directions for interpreting the message of the tape written on the tape itself, and translation. Here he begins to talk about bonding, pairs, and strands. Implicitly and explicitly self-referential sentences. To begin with, let us look at sentences which, at first glance, may seem to provide the simplest examples of self-reference. Some such sentences are these. Number one, this sentence contains five words. Number two, this sentence is meaningless because it is self-referential. Number three, this sentence no verb. Number four, this sentence is false, the Epimenides paradox. Number five, the sentence I am now writing is the sentence you are now reading. Interconnected parts and layers, the back and forth between data and program. Here we have a diagram of mRNA passing through a ribosome. So what it's doing is reading and writing code, uh, cutting bits up, inserting, removing, things like that. As if you were playing a reel-to-reel -reel tape and could actively cut out or add as it's going. Here are a few pictures from the page that kind of outline some terminology related to genetics and DNA. Um, genetics and DNA being a good analogy for data, right? I mean, it is data, but the way that it works is very much the way that we code, that we write programs. Here, he connects these two things, DNA and his TNT system. He's making the symbolic connection between these two fields. Here you can see a great central dog map, right? This is basically him putting these two things against each other symbolically. Isomorphism. Again, back to that always. Chapter 17, Church, Turing, Tarski, and Others. Every aspect of thinking can be viewed as a high-level description of a system which, on a low level, is governed by simple, even formal rules. Church's theorem. There is no infallible method for telling theorems of TNT from non-theorems. Building on Church's theorem will be a collection of different interpretations, right? So you have the Church-Turing thesis, the tautological version. Mathematics problems can be solved only by doing mathematics. Next is the Church-Turing thesis standard version. Suppose there is a method which a sentient being follows in order to sort numbers into two classes. Suppose further that this method always yields an answer within a finite amount of time, and that it always gives the same answer for a given number. Then, some terminating flute program, i.e. some general recursive function, exists which gives exactly the same answers as the sentient being's method does. Next is the Church-Turing thesis Hardy's version. At bottom, all mathematics are isomorphic. Next are some thoughts by Hardy on Ramanujan. The part of this passage which I have italicized seems to me to be an excellent characterization of some of the subtlest features of intelligence in general. Finally, Hardy concludes somewhat nostalgically. His work has not the simplicity and inevitableness of the very greatest works. It would be greater if it were less strange. One gift it has which no one can deny, profound and invincible originality. He would probably have been a greater mathematician if he had been caught and tamed a little in his youth. He would have discovered more that was new and that, no doubt, of greater importance. On the other hand, he would have been less of a Ramanujan and more of a European professor, and the loss might have been greater than the gain. The esteem in which Hardy held Ramanujan is revealed by the romantic way in which he speaks of him. 
Imaginary and analogical thought processes intrinsically require several layers of substrates. It is precisely at this same point that creativity starts to emerge, which would imply that creativity intrinsically depends upon certain kinds of uninterpretable lower-level events. So here we have this nice diagram of the computer high-level language, a human brain symbol level, and the universe of natural numbers, right? And the isomorphic connections between these things. Next is the church Turing thesis, the soulist version. Some kinds of things which a brain can do can be vaguely approximated on a computer, but not most, and certainly not the interesting ones. But anyway, even if they all could, that would still leave the soul for computers to explain. Here is a, a great diagram comparing the brain symbolic in interpretations, um, macroscopic world substrate information, computer levels of interpretation, and how to connect these things. Uh, you know, his conclusion here is how far deep down does this go? Well, recursion says that it, forever. Irrational and rational can coexist on different levels. This diagram is fantastic. So what you have here is uh, an untrue mathematical statement. 2 plus 2 equals 5. An irrational statement, uh, which you can see if you are zooming in here, uh, made up of actual mathematical statements, which are correct, which, which are true. 3 plus 2 is 5. 4 plus 6 is 10. Those things are true, though 2 plus 2 being 5 does not seem uh, logical, rational. Gödel's theorem must apply to cybernetic machines because it is of the essence of being a machine, that it should be a concrete instantiation of a formal system. True on the hardware level, but since there may be higher levels, it is not the last word on the subject. Next, we have the Church Turing Thesis AI version. Mental processes of any sort can be simulated by a computer program whose underlying language is of power equal to that of Floop, that is, in which all partial recursive functions can be programmed. The AI thesis being, as the intelligence of machines evolves, its underlying mechanisms will gradually converge to the mechanisms of human intelligence. Our minds contain interpreters which accept notions which are so complex that we cannot consciously describe them. The same can be said about how we respond to music, incidentally. You have syntactic form and predictably terminating tests very close to the surface. You have semantic form and open-ended test, and meaning is not localized. It certainly doesn't only exist on the surface. Chapter 18, Artificial Intelligence, Retrospects. The Turing Test, an imitation game. The original question, can machines think? I believe to be too meaningless to deserve discussion. Nevertheless, I believe that at the end of the century, the use of words and general educated opinions will have altered so much that one will be able to speak of machines thinking without expecting to be contradicted. Here's a list of objections. This is quite long. Number one, the theological objection. Thinking is a function of man's immortal soul. God has given an immortal soul to every man and woman, but not to any other animal or to machines. Hence, no animal or machine can think. Number two, the heads in the sand objection. The consequences of machines thinking would be too dreadful. Let us hope and believe that they cannot do so. The mathematical objection. This is essentially the Lucas argument. Number four, the argument from consciousness. Not until a machine can write a sonnet or compose a concerto because of thoughts and emotions felt, and not by the chance fall of symbols, could we agree that machine equals brain. That is, not only write it, but know that it is written. It. No mechanism could feel, and not merely artificially signal, an easy contrivance. Pleasure at its successes, grief when its valves fuse, be warmed by flattery. Be made miserable by its mistakes. Be charmed by sex. 
be angry or depressed when it cannot get what it wants. Number five, arguments from various disabilities. These arguments take the form, I grant you that you can make machines do all the things that you have mentioned, but you will never be able to make one do X. Numerous features X are suggested in this connection. I offer a selection, be kind, resourceful, beautiful, friendly, have initiative, have a sense of humor, tell right from wrong, make mistakes, fall in love, enjoy strawberries and cream, make someone fall in love with it, learn from experience, use words properly, be the subject of its own thought, have as much diversity of behavior as man, do something really new. Number six. Lady Lovelace's objection. Our most detailed information of Babbage's analytical engine comes from a memoir by Lady Lovelace. In it, she states, the analytical engine has no pretensions to originate anything. It can do whatever we know how to order it to perform. Number seven, argument from continuity in the nervous system. The nervous system is certainly not a discrete state machine. A small error in the information about the size of a nervous impulse impinging on a neuron may make a large difference to the size of the outgoing impulse. It may be argued that, this being so, one cannot expect to be able to mimic the behavior of the nervous system with a discrete state system. Number eight, the argument from informality of behavior. It seems to run something like this. If each man had a definite set of rules of conduct by which he regulated his life, he would be no better than a machine. But there are no such rules, so men cannot be machines. Number nine, the argument from extrasensory perception. Let us play the imitation game using as witnesses a man who is good as a telepathic receiver and a digital computer. The interrogator can ask such questions as, what suit does the card in my right hand belong to? The man by telepathy or clairvoyance gives the right answer 130 times out of 400 cards. The machine can only guess at random and perhaps gets 104 right, so the interrogator makes the right identification. Joseph Weizenbaum wrote a piece called Computer Power and Human Reasoning. The big takeaway there is perceiving a man behind the curtain. This anecdote that you're looking at on the screen is about a program called ELISA, which creates a program called Doctor, which is able to trick people into believing that they're really talking to a doctor. One could define AI as coming into existence at the moment when mechanical devices take over any tasks previously performed only by human minds. Finally, we have Tesla's theorem. AI is whatever hasn't been done yet. Next, we're going to look at some domains of AI. I'm not going to read all of these because it's extensive, but I'll, I'll hit maybe the, the major bullet points here, like mechanical translation, game playing, proving theorems in various parts of mathematics, symbolic manipulation of mathematical expressions, vision, hearing, understanding natural languages, producing natural language, creating original thoughts or works of art. I'm partial to these. Analogical thinking and learning. Here we have the concept of the meta-author, author of the author of the result. If I write a computer program and that program writes music or writes other programs, the question arises, who composes computer music? Is the computer composing? The question is best unasked, but it cannot be completely ignored. An answer is difficult to provide. The algorithms are deterministic, simple, and understandable. No complicated or hard to understand computations are involved. No learning programs are used. No random processes occur. The machine functions in a perfectly mechanical and straightforward manner. However, the result is sequences of sound that are unplanned in fine detail by the composer, even though the overall structure of the section is completely and precisely specified. Thus, the composer is often surprised and pleasantly surprised at the details of the realization of his ideas. To this extent, only is the computer composing. We call the process algorithmic composition, but we immediately re-emphasize that the algorithms are transparently simple. I followed this line of thinking and algorithmically composed a piece of music I call centrifugal force. It is fugue-like. To explain very simply here, I have a sequence of notes 
which I also assign a length value to the sequence of notes. Do all kinds of permutations, inverting the intervals, backwards, forwards, changing registers. You've been listening to the song. Some concepts in this portion of the chapter are problem reduction and sub goals, mechanical mode, fixed framework, intelligent mode, the overview. When I was creating this piece of music, this is not written by a computer, but it is written by code. Everything that's occurring here is, is mathematical. These are not sounds that derive from my intention to express emotionally. These are purely realizations of mathematical sequences. So here you have the endless goal tree that you can continue to keep driving down further and further and further. I could have done that with this song. There could have been more and more orchestration and instrumentation that could drive into new segments. What you're hearing is really like these rhythms and these sequences condensed or expanded, right? So the low bass notes are often the most longest expansion of the sequence. And then the upper melodic instrumentation, I have compressed those sequences, right? Those strings into proportionally related segments of music. The crux of AI is representation of knowledge modularity of knowledge. How easy is it to insert new information? How easy is it to revise old information? Deductive versus analogical awareness. Stored in memory does not equal known. There are things that are in our memory that we cannot recall, that we cannot surface, that we cannot interpret as part of our mind. Deep code. Chapter 19, Artificial Intelligence Prospects. Thoughts on alternatives and possibilities from George Steiner's After Babel. Hypotheticals, imaginaries, conditionals, the syntax of counterfactuality and contingency may well be the generative centers of human speech. They do more than occasion philosophical and grammatical perplexity, no less than future tenses to which they are. One feels related and with which they ought probably to be classed in the larger set of suppositionals or alternates. These if propositions are fundamental to the dynamics of human feeling. Ours is the ability, the need, to gainsay or unsay the world, to image and speak it otherwise. We need a word which will designate the power, the compulsion of language to posit otherness. Perhaps alternity will do to define the other than the case. The counterfactual propositions, images, shapes of will, and evasion with which we charge our mental being and by means of which we build the changing, largely fictive milieu of our somatic and our social existence. It is unlikely that man as we know him would have survived without the fictive, counterfactual, anti-determinist means of language, without the semantic capacity generated and stored in the superfluous zones of the cortex, to conceive of, to articulate possibilities beyond the treadmill of organic decay and death. Think how immeasurably poor our mental lives would be if we didn't have this creative capacity for slipping out of the midst of reality into soft what ifs. Some notes I have here are layers of stability, constants, perimeters, variables, frames, and nested contexts. So here we have a concept network, recursive and derivative narrative mapping. This is kind of how we connect our ideas. Some additional thoughts, meta descriptions, descriptions of descriptions, essences of meaning and intention. Hofstetter introduces the concept of malaphor, which is a cross between malapropism and metaphor, a recombinant idea. He goes on to talk about focusing, making a description whose focus is some part of the drawing in the box to the exclusion of everything else, figure and ground. Next idea being filtering, which involves making a description which concatenates on some particular ways of viewing the contents of the box and deliberately ignores all other aspects. So here we have a few figures, pattern recognition, and being able to compare these Bongard problems, finding which belong together and which are an exception to the rule. Human visual pattern recognition can occur at the subconscious level. Frame plus actor equals symbol. 
you need these things to be able to have a symbol. A symbol doesn't exist without the interpreter. Fission and fusion, a balanced and complete analogous model of inversion. Here we have the schematic diagram of the dialogue Crab Cannon, which is one of his fictional narrative pieces that he writes to outline the technical concepts in the official chapters. So what you're looking at here is Tortoise and Achilles, two characters who are saying things. And then you have Crab, another character, as the kind of central point to invert and lead you out of the dialogue, which is actually just a repeat of the beginning, but backwards. So conceptual development goes metaphase, anaphase, telophase, a plural thing made singular and re-pluralized wrongly. And a couple thoughts here would be multiple representations, forced matching, creativity and randomness against intelligence and emotions. This is a, a dichotomy I come back to with some regularity. Here he offers up 10 questions that should be asked about AI. Number one, will a computer program ever write beautiful music? Number two, will emotions be explicitly programmed into a machine? Number three, will a thinking computer be able to add fast? Number four, will there be chess programs that can beat anyone? Number five, Will there be special locations in memory which store parameters governing the behavior of the program, such that if you reached in and changed them, you would be able to make the program smarter or stupider or more creative or more interested in baseball? In short, would you be able to tune the program by fiddling with it on a relatively low level? Number six, could you tune an AI program to act like me or you or halfway between us? Number seven, will there be a heart to an AI program, or will it simply consist of senseless loops and sequences of trivial operations, in the words of Marvin Minsky? Number eight, will AI programs ever become super intelligent? Number nine, number nine, he seems to be saying that AI programs will be virtually identical to people at some point. Won't there be a difference? Number 10, Will we understand what intelligence and consciousness and free will and the concept of I are when we have made an intelligent program? Chapter 20, Strange Loops or Tangled Hierarchies. Can machines possess originality? Here are some thoughts from Arthur Samuel, written in 1960. It is my conviction that machines cannot possess originality in the sense implied by Wiener in his thesis that machines can and do transcend some of the limitations of their designers, and that in doing so, they may be both effective and dangerous. A machine is not a genie. It does not work by magic. It does not possess a will. And, Wiener to the contrary, nothing comes out which has not been put in, barring, of course, an infrequent case of malfunctioning. The intentions which the machine seems to manifest are the intentions of the human programmer, as specified in advance, or they are subsidiary intentions derived from these, following rules specified by the programmer. We can even anticipate higher levels of abstraction, just as Wiener does, in which the program will not only modify the subsidiary intentions, but will also modify the rules which are used in their derivation, or in which it will modify the ways in which it modifies the rules, and so on, or even in which one machine will design and construct a second machine with enhanced capabilities. However, and this is important, the machine will not and cannot do any of these things until it has been instructed as to how to proceed. There is, and logically there must always remain, a complete hiatus between any ultimate extension and elaboration in this process of carrying out man's wishes and the development within the machine of a will of its own. To believe otherwise is either to believe in magic or to believe that the existence of man's will is an illusion and that man's actions are as mechanical as the machines. Perhaps Wiener's article and my rebuttal have both been mechanically determined, but this I refuse to believe. Here we're revisiting the notion of authorship. You can look at this diagram. Here there are three authors, each writing about the other. So who's really the author here? Strange Loops, 
requires some prime mover and inviolate substrate, as if it were outside the system. Here we can explore Escher's illustration of hands drawing each other. That, to me, is very much like a Klein bottle, where the exterior becomes the interior, and the interior becomes the exterior again. I do recommend you check out I Am a Strange Loop, which is far less technical, far more narrative and linear, as opposed to episodic. It is much more about his life and his relationship with his wife, who passed away in the early 90s, and how he contended with that as an individual and a father. Introspection and insanity, a Gerdelian problem. The upside-down face, right? One, a young, beautiful woman. We turn it over. We see the older, weathered woman. Can we understand our minds and brains? Good question to ask. Here we have all sorts of subject-object dichotomy, acting versus thinking, doing versus speaking, hardware and software analogy for brain and mind, valuing material versus the symbolic. Here we arrive at the symbol for self, I, which leads to the conundrum of free will. At the crux, then, of our understanding ourselves will come an understanding of the tangled hierarchy of levels inside our minds. My position is rather similar to the viewpoint put forth by neuroscientist Roger Sperry in his excellent article, Mind, Brain, and Humanist Values, from which I quote a little here. In my own hypothetical brain model, conscious awareness does get representation as a very real causal agent and rates an important place in the causal sequence and chain of control in brain events, in which it appears as an active operational force. To put it very simply, it comes down to the issue of who pushes whom around in the population of causal forces that occupy the cranium. It is a matter, in other words, of straightening out the peck order hierarchy among intracranial control agents. There exists within the cranium a whole world of diverse causal forces. What is more, there are forces within the forces within forces, as in no other cubic half foot of universe that we know. To make a long story short, If one keeps climbing upward in the chain of command within the brain, one finds at the very top those overall organizational forces and dynamic properties of the large patterns of cerebral excitation that are correlated with mental states or psychic activity. Near the apex of this command system in the brain, we find ideas. Man over the chimpanzee has ideas and ideals. In the brain model proposed here, the causal potency of an idea or an ideal becomes just as real as that of a molecule, a cell, or a nervous impulse. Ideas cause ideas and help evolve new ideas. They interact with each other and with other mental forces in the same brain and neighboring brains and thanks to global communication in far distant foreign brains. And they also interact with the external surroundings to produce in toto a burst-wise advance and evolution that is far beyond anything to hit the evolutionary scene yet, including the emergence of the living cell. In short, a Gerdelian vortex where all levels cross. It is irrelevant whether the system is running deterministically. What makes us call it a choice maker is whether we can identify with a high-level description of the process which takes place when the program runs. On a low, machine language level, the program looks like any other program. On a high, chunked level, qualities such as will, intuition, creativity, and consciousness can emerge. Next, we're talking about an Escher vortex where all levels cross. Here we see this diagram, which represents one of his illustrations called Print Gallery. Next, we're looking at the simplification of that representation to where it becomes just the person. We've boiled the loop down to its its simplest format. Next, a Bach vortex where all levels cross. And here we see a sequence of notes. Uh, This hexagonal modulation scheme of Bach's endlessly rising canon form is a closed loop when shepherd tones are used. Now, a shepherd tone is one that seems to rise forever. It feels because of the sequence of notes and the volumes of those notes as they are performed that it continues to rise and rise and rise and rise and rise, but it never resolves. It never lands. It never arrives at that top point. So that is called a shepherd tone. Uh, Some other ideas related to the shepherd tone that I like as a musician would be 
Coltrane fifths, pitch axis theory. Now the Coltrane fifths, what's going on inside of that idea is also what led me to manipulate the lengths of time within the piece of music called centrifugal force. So the interesting thing about music is that when we speed up the performance, pitches can alter as well. A few final thoughts. I must mention that this book is not exclusively academic in a left brain sense. Each chapter is preceded by a narrative segment centering on Achilles and Tortoise, as mentioned previously, as well as their encounters with friends that analogically resemble the concepts explained in the main text chapters. You could read only these conceptual fable-like sections and still take away an excellent collection of insights about consciousness and computation, although they are most useful as mechanisms to seed the concepts to you in non-technical terms. It's not hard to like these passages because of how well-written and fun the interactions are between all the characters. They're weird. The author himself even shows up late into the book. I like them a lot. These segments do a great job of priming your intellect for the difficult analytical lessons on consciousness and computations in the proper chapters. Of course, this book was put into print over 40 years ago. Some of the science has been eclipsed, but much of the philosophy holds up well to this day. I hope you enjoyed this review. Cannot recommend this book enough. Have had a great time putting together the Twitter thread, gathering this all up into a blog post so I could actually make sense of my notes, and then performing this reading for you, uh, giving you some looks inside of the book, some of the diagrams, some of the quotes and things like that. Definitely recommend that you read this book and appreciate you tuning in.